Welcome to the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast for the October 10th, 2022 issue. This is Season 3, Episode 1. Evidence-Based Hair is a podcast produced by the Donovan Hair Academy and addresses new research in the field of hair loss. We'll use our time together not only to talk about what's new, but to reflect on how all this new information ties in with the accumulating body of information we've come to learn in the past. And we'll think carefully about where we're heading in the future as a hair loss community. I'll use various studies each week as a pivot point to discuss key diagnostic pearls and treatment tips that hopefully allow us all to become better practitioners. This podcast was created for practitioners of various backgrounds, but regardless of whether you care for patients with hair loss or simply care about the topic of hair loss, this podcast will be of interest. This podcast was created for educational purposes and shouldn't be considered a substitute for medical advice. The second Monday of each month is dedicated to the four T's, telogen effluvium, traction alopecia, trichotillomania, and tinea capitis, and that's where we will head today. We're going to review six interesting studies from the past few months. We'll begin by talking about tinea capitis from guinea pigs. You know, guinea pigs harbor T. mentagrophytes and T. benhamii, and it's not uncommon for children and sometimes adults to develop tinea type infections from guinea pigs. We'll talk about tinea capitis in a young child who owned a guinea pig. Then we'll talk about hair loss from COVID. Have you ever wondered if Omicron is more likely to cause hair loss than Delta or the original SARS-CoV-2 variant? Or are the new variants less likely to cause hair loss? Well, I've wondered for some time, and a new study points us in the right direction to suggest that perhaps these new variants are less likely to cause hair loss. Then we'll talk about hair loss from isotretinoin. Isotretinoin goes by a number of trade names, you know many as Accutane, but there's there's many now. Isotretinoin can cause hair loss in the form of a telogen effluvium. There's a very important unanswered question, and it's gone on for decades. And that is, can isotretinoin not only cause telogen effluvium, but can it affect the rates of androgenetic hair loss, can it affect in any possible way, shape, or form alopecia areata and scarring alopecia? These are highly controversial topics. No study has addressed it. One study now looks at this issue, and it's set out to look at the types of hair loss in isotretinoin users. It's a small study, but it's fascinating. I'd like to point out today the possibility in this small study that perhaps isotretinoin causes more than just a telogen effluvium. We'll take a look at it. Then we'll talk about trichotillomania. Is it possible that some patients with trichotillomania just resolve their trichotillomania and never experience episodes again? Is there some sort of a natural recovery that happens in some patients who don't have counseling, who don't receive pharmacologic treatment, The answer seems to be yes, and it happens in about a quarter of patients. Then we'll talk about another trichotillomania study, and that is the frequency of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in patients with trichotillomania. Do patients with ADHD and trichotillomania have a worse course? Do they have a better course? What are the features of patients with ADHD who have trichotillomania? We'll take a look at this. Very important subject because ADHD seems to occur in 15 to 25 percent of patients with trichotillomania. And then we'll look finally at a clinical finding in iron deficiency anemia. We've learned about spoon-shaped nails as a sign of iron deficiency anemia. We've talked about pale skin or pale conjunctiva in patients with iron deficiency anemia. We're aware of the fatigue in patients with iron deficiency anemia, shortness of breath when you run a mile. But what about blue sclera or blueness of the whites of the eyes? This, in fact, is a finding in iron deficiency anemia that's been known for a long, long time. It's often forgot about. 
We'll take a look at a very interesting report of blue sclera associated with iron deficiency anemia. The references for all of these studies I'll talk about today are in the show notes that accompany this episode. So let's begin by talking about tinea capitis from guinea pigs. It's a relevant subject. Guinea pigs are popular worldwide. And I'll come to a slide in, in just a few minutes. But in the U.S., some 1.5 million households own guinea pigs. It's a half a million in Canada, half a million in Italy. Parts of Europe have similar statistics. Lots of people have guinea pigs. And what we'll learn today is that guinea pigs harbor uh, dermatophytes or fungal organisms, and they can pass these to their owners, especially young children in the family. So we'll take a look at an interesting study published very recently in July in the journal Einstein Sao Paulo. So dermatophytoses are a type of fungal infection that causes disease of the skin, the hair, and the nails. And dermatophytes belong to three different genera, trichophyton, microsporum, and epidermophyton. And these fungal infections can be acquired from humans to human transmission. We call those anthropophilic fungi. Some fungi transmit from animals to humans. We call those zoophilic. And some come from the soil. We call those geophilic fungi. Tinea capitis is a specific dermatophyte that affects the scalp, affects the scalp hair. And tinea capitis is quite common in prepubertal children. It's thought that the environment of the scalp in young children is perfect to harbor fungal organisms. With the changes in oil production around puberty, it makes the scalp less hospitable to fungi. Now, teenagers can have tinea capitis. Adults can have tinea capitis, absolutely. But the environment in the scalp isn't quite as good to harbor these organisms. And as we've talked about before, there's a number of these dermatoscopic or trichoscopic features of tinea capitis, which are really important to know about. Comma hair, corkscrews, and we've talked about these in other episodes. We're going to talk today about the carry-on variant and a young child that developed carry-on from a guinea pig. There's many forms of tinea capitis. Some are non-inflammatory, some are inflammatory. The non-inflammatory forms are pretty common. Black dot tinea capitis, gray patch tinea capitis. These are forms of tinea capitis where there's patches of hair loss. It doesn't really look too red. It is just looking like alopecia areata sometimes or looking like areas of hair loss that mimics trichotillomania. The dermatoscopic features help us confirm that it's actually tinea capitis. But there are some forms of tinea capitis which are red, inflamed, boggy. They are painful. Children have inflamed lymph nodes. They are uncomfortable. Children present to emergency rooms. Parents take them to the emergency rooms because it looks and feels so painful. The reason we need to be aware of the carry-on variant in particular is because it can lead to scarring alopecia. It can lead to permanent hair loss. And there are large numbers of children around the world that have permanent hair loss for the rest of their life because they experienced a tinea capitis infection when they were children. So carry-on infections are these inflammatory variants of tinea capitis, and they develop most often in pediatric patients, age 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's the age at which tinea capitis often um, is encountered. The inflammatory forms often occur from zoophilic fungi, fungal organisms that are transferred from an animal to a human. Those are the organisms that when they find themselves on a human, the human immune system amounts a tremendous inflammatory response to try to get rid of them. And so zoophilic fungi are more likely to cause redness, pustules, crusting, edema, swelling. And so microsporum canis, trichophyton varicosum, T. equinium, 
Amnanum tebenheimii. These are zoophilic fungi that often cause inflammatory forms, especially the carrion. I'm going to talk about T. benhamii today and T. mentagrophytes because these are the organisms that these little guinea pigs often have. And guinea pigs can carry these organisms and have no hair loss, no symptoms. They just carry them asymptomatically. And so veterinarians are very familiar with T. mentagrophytes and T. benhamii in guinea pigs. And I'd like you to know about it as well. So T. mentagrophytes is commonly found in animals that live in households like rabbits, guinea pigs, porcupines, chinchillas, other rodents, horses, dogs, cats, calves, monkeys. These have T. mentagrophytes and wild animals do too like foxes and muskrats and squirrels. T. benhamii is another organism that is part of the T. mentagrophytes complex and it's also commonly isolated from guinea pigs. Many cases of tinea capitis that were thought to be due to T. mentagrophytes are now understood to be due to trichophyton benhamii. They look somewhat similar, they have similar characteristics, but it's realized now that many prior infections that were called T. mentagrophytes are actually trichophyton benhamii. So this new study published in Einstein, Sao Paulo, this is a journal, describe a 17-year-old, seven-year-old female patient who developed a carry-on caused by T. mentagrophytes from her guinea pig. She presented to the emergency room in November 2019 with an extensive scalp lesion and fever. This lesion was noticed two weeks prior and it, become, it became worse and so she went to the emergency room. She had a history of scabies, she had a history of recurrent tinea of the skin that had been treated with antibiotics. She had been prescribed topical antibiotics before getting additional help in the emergency room. When she presented to the emergency department, she had this scalp lesion, which was about 15 by 20 centimeters in size. It had purulent discharge. Lab tests were, for the most part, normal, except she had elevated neutrophils, elevated CRP, sorry, elevated ESR, her CRP was normal. And in this study, which is available free online, images available with Creative Commons license, you can see very nice images of what happens to some children with tinea capitis infections from their guinea pig. This was a lesion which was red, it's inflammatory. The immune system is trying to get rid of this fungal organism. There's crust, there's pus. And she was started on oral antibiotics. And the lesion was quite extensive. And she had the surgery team involved to help debride this lesion, to help get rid of some of this crust and scaling. And some of the tissue was sent off for culture. And that's really important with any suspected tinea capitis fungal infection is we need to figure out what is the organism so that we can figure out where it might have come from. Did it come from another human? Did it come from a dog? Did it come from a guinea pig? Fungal cultures are so important. And when tissue was examined from the scalp of this young seven-year-old child, it suggested that it, there was a dermatophyte fungal infection she was treated with oral terbinafine and intravenous fluconazole. Eventually, the terbinafine was replaced with griseofulvin. IV fluconazole was continued. Fungal cultures showed T. mentagrophytes, trichophyton mentagrophytes. Fluconazole was replaced with itraconazole. Griseofulvin was continued. The patient improved. Quite a serious case initially of a very large lesion, an unwell child with a very large draining scalp lesion taken to the OR to debride or remove some of the scaling and crust and tissue. The child improved with, antibi with antifungal treatment but unfortunately had permanent hair loss to some degree. 
and the authors show photos three months after finishing oral antifungal therapy showing some degree of hair loss. Three months is still pretty early in a course and the scalp is pretty resilient, especially in young children. And it'll be interesting to know what the scalp looks like at nine months and one year. Uh, there still can be some improvement that is possible, although the feared complication of tinea capitis, especially the inflammatory forms, is permanent hair loss. And the authors suspect there is some permanent hair loss in this child. And so the authors do a very nice job in this report documenting the clinical course. They show photos of the scalp. They show photos of the mother's tinea corporis or fungal infections on the mother's arm. They show the child's wonderful guinea pig. And so we need to understand trichophyton mentagrophytes and T. benhamii in our families who own guinea pigs because guinea pigs can harbor these fungal organisms asymptomatically. And I think this is really a very nice study. There's lots of families that own guinea pigs. We talk a lot about dogs and cats. We don't talk quite as much about guinea pigs, but it's a really important subject for us to know about if we are hair loss specialists. Many guinea pigs that are infected with trichophyton mentagrophytes fungal organisms don't develop any clinical signs. The guinea pigs don't have hair loss. The guinea pigs aren't itchy. So they're asymptomatic carriers. And some studies have suggested that T. mentagrophytes ranges from anywhere from 1 to 34% in these organisms. A very nice study published in 2013 by Haruma suggested that T. mentagrophytes was found in 19 out of 20 asymptomatic guinea pigs that were in a zoo in Japan. Another study by Bartosz in 2019 suggested that in a group of 41 animals that were housed together, including rabbits, rats, rats mice, guinea pigs, 18 out of the 26 guinea pigs had fungal infections, but only 11 showed signs of any type of fungal infections. And of these 18 confirmed cases, 11 were from Trichophyton mentagrophytes, 15 were from Trichophyton benhamii, and 8 of the guinea pigs had both. And so we need to know about T. mentagrophytes, we need to know, know about T. benhamii if we're going to uh, discuss fungal infections from guinea pigs. T. benhamii is increasing worldwide over the last 15 years. You don't find this discussed a lot in earlier textbooks, earlier manuscripts. It's becoming a more prevalent fungal infection. It has spread ubiquitously to guinea pigs since the turn of the millennium, and it's becoming an emerging problem. So we need to know about T. benhamii. In a study in 2016, T. benhamii was isolated in more than 90% of guinea pigs in a pet shop in Berlin. It's thought that perhaps private ownership of guinea pigs has a less frequent, maybe 50% of private owners of guinea pigs have T. benhamii, but it's becoming quite an important issue. So overall, it's thought that 50 to 90% of guinea pigs have this T. benhamii. They may harbor them asymptomatically, and that's really the key point here. And so it's really important for guinea pig owners and, and vets to be well aware of this asymptomatic carriage. And if guinea pigs are found to carry T. benhamii and T. mentagrophytes, there is specific topical treatments and uh, making sure that these antifungal agents go across the skin of these guinea pigs to help eradicate the fungal organisms. And when we see children with tinea capitis, yes, it's important to ask about, is there someone in the class with tinea capitis? Does your brother have tinea capitis? Do you share combs and, and other fomites? Yes, but we need to know about the pets. Not only dogs, not only cats, not only rabbits, but other exotic pets and the guinea pig. And so I think this is really important According to a website, K 
cave cage, cavicage.com. There's 3.8 million guinea pigs in the US, 1.5 million in Germany, 800,000 in the UK, same number in France, half a million guinea pigs in Canada, Spain, Italy. So guinea pig ownership is pretty common. And I really like these statistics because, you know, we spend a lot of time as hair specialists learning about dogs and cats and other transmitters of fungal infections. But certainly guinea pigs are very relevant for us and I really like this study and um, I think it reminds us of the importance of good histories and knowing about guinea pigs. So from guinea pigs we move on to COVID-19. Have you wondered, as I have, if Omicron and the variants of Omicron are less likely to give hair loss than Delta or the original SARS-CoV-2 virus that affected us in January, February, and March 2020? Well, a new study suggests that yes, it is. And this is really a one of a kind. We haven't had good data giving us the ability to answer this question. Do we really have less hair loss with Omicron compared to Delta? This was a study in the British Journal of Dermatology in July by Visconti and colleagues. We're well aware, if you listen to the news, listen to reports, that these various waves have different symptoms. During the Omicron wave, patients are more likely to have sore throat, hoarse voice. They're less likely to have fever, less likely to have loss of smell and cough compared to the Delta wave. And so in a new study, researchers from the UK set out to investigate whether the frequency and duration of symptoms is different in Omicron compared to Delta. So they performed a retrospective study looking at self-reported data from 348,000 UK users of an app called the Zoe COVID study app. So this is a really fascinating study. You have this app that patients have access to where each day on their smartphones, they can log, do I have any symptoms? Did I test positive for COVID? Do, do I have hair loss? Do I have sore throat, cough, runny nose? And so the authors in this study specifically looked at five skin manifestations. Red, purple toes, an unpleasant sensation like pins and needles, rashes on the arms, red welts on the face or body, like hives, as well as unusual hair loss. And of course, my attention was drawn here to unusual hair loss, but we'll take a look at these five skin findings, but we'll specifically pay attention to whether hair loss issues are different in Omicron than Delta waves. And the authors also investigated whether vaccination had any effect on the frequency of these symptoms. So what is the Zoe COVID study app? Well, this is an app whereby patients were recruited from social media and anybody could download the app and log data on the app. Even if you've never had COVID, even if you're not vaccinated, just download the app and punch in data. And large, large numbers of individuals participated in this study and logged data routinely. So the app collects information on sex, age, ethnicity, height, weight, other diseases that people have, medications they use. So it's a pretty detailed app. And users have the opportunity to provide daily updates on 33 COVID-related symptoms. And the authors in particular were looking at five skin manifestations here. Red, purple toes, pins and needles, rashes on the arms, hives, and hair loss. And users could self-report if and when they had a COVID infection, document how it was performed, whether a PCR, lateral flow test, antibody test, and they could log vaccination data. So pretty unique study. And I think these large population studies, which use things like apps, are really relevant and are becoming more common. And we're becoming much more comfortable with large, large data and the ability to manage large, large data. And so there were 348,691 UK users of the Zoe COVID app. 42,000 had SARS-CoV-2 infection during Delta. 75,000 had infections during Omicron wave. 
Burning skin rashes, fever, and cough were more common in Delta than Omicron waves. Skin manifestations were more common in Delta, 17% compared to 11%. And skin problems lasted longer in the Delta wave than Omicron wave. The exception was rashes on the arm, on the hands, and feet, acral rashes. Symptoms lasted longer during Delta than Omicron. They lasted about six days in Delta, five days in Omicron. And interestingly, symptoms were pretty similar in vaccinated and unvaccinated people, except burning skin rashes. Burning skin rashes were low, lower in vaccinated individuals. So what about hair loss? Well, 2.4% of COVID infections, self, people with COVID infections self-reported hair loss compared to 0.8 with Omicron. So it seems like the Omicron wave was less likely to be associated with reporting hair loss. Now, the actual numbers are a bit of a surprise. We think that COVID infections can give hair loss in anywhere from 10% to even 50%. Now, these are not individuals by which a clinician asks them about their hair loss. Do you in fact have hair loss? These are patients that punch it into a smartphone. It's self-reported data. But because these are really large numbers, 42,000 uh, and more, double that, uh, were infected with in the Omicron wave. These are large numbers of patients. And so even though it's self-reported, it's, it's somewhat reliable to indicate that people just aren't reporting hair loss as commonly in Omicron. And so I think it's not important not to focus so much on the actual percentage, but the main message here that hair loss seems to be less common in Omicron than Delta. Hair loss during the Delta wave was much more predictive of a COVID positive result. And so during the Delta wave, if someone punched in, they had hair loss, they were pretty likely to have a COVID positive infection preceding it. But in the Omicron wave, if people said, I have unusual hair loss, it really didn't seem to correlate all that well whether they had a positive COVID test before. In fact, many people that said, I have unusual hair loss, they were in fact less likely to even have a positive COVID test. And so the main message there is hair loss really has less relevance during the Omicron wave. And so during the early periods of COVID in March 2020, April, May, June, all through 2020, if patients come in with hair loss, hey doc, I'm shedding. The thing that is front and center on the mind is, well, maybe you had COVID. What this study tells us is that when patients come in in 2022 with concerns, hey doc, I have hair loss, you should certainly be thinking about other things ahead of COVID-19. It may be that they had COVID-19, absolutely. But this study tells us that hair loss is really less of a concern with these newer variants. And I think that's really important information. They're targeting the skin much differently than earlier variants. And so the main conclusion here is that skin symptoms are less common with Omicron than Delta. This is very valuable information. This data was really not available in the literature in this manner to allow us to advise patients, to allow us to adjust our practice. And hair loss is much more relevant of an issue in the Delta wave than it is in the Omicron wave. Of course, Omicron can cause hair loss, absolutely. But I think we have to be aware of the fact that patients coming in now with hair loss, we need to really be thinking very carefully about a large array of issues. If it was July 2020 and patients come in with hair loss, we may start the discussion by asking, did you have fever? Did you think you had exposure to COVID-19? 
do you have loss of smell, loss of taste? Those questions are on the bottom of the list now as Omicron uh, moves through the population. So from COVID-19, let's talk about isotretinoin. Isotretinoin is an acne medication, uh, not only used for acne, but used in some scarring alopecias. Um, isotretinoin has a number of trade names. Depending on the country one is in, they go by different names. There's many, many of them. One of the more famous ones in years gone by was Accutane, and so many people listening no isotretinoin by Accutane, but certainly there are many, many trade names now. What do you say when patients ask you, how common is hair loss from isotretinoin? Well, the data is all over the place, but anywhere from 0.2% to 12% of users of isotretinoin have a telogen effluvium or hair shedding. So, 90% of patients who use isotretinoin don't have hair loss from telogen effluvium. But a very interesting study, which is unique, it's new, it's one of a kind, it was published by Tran and colleagues in the journal, International Journal of Trichology in the July-August issue. This is Dr. Goh's group. And I'd like to review this with you because it has some fascinating information so we know telogen effluvium is a possible side effect of isotretinoin. It still is debated about how common this is. In Season 1, Episode 6 of the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast, we talked about a study in JAD International looking at how common telogen effluvium is in low-dose isotretinoin and high-dose isotretinoin. In low-dose isotretinoin, it seemed like about 3% of users had telogen effluvium. In high-dose isotretinoin, it was closer to 6. A newly published study sets out not to determine how common is telogen effluvium with isotretinoin use, but it set out to answer two unique questions. What type of hair loss occurs in patients who say, hey, I have hair loss and I took isotretinoin. What are the types of hair loss that occur? Is it just telogen effluvium? Or do patients say they have other types of hair loss? Or do doctors diagnose other types of hair loss? We spend a lot of time thinking about telogen effluvium, telogen effluvium, hair shedding, hair shedding. But maybe there's other types of hair loss that occur. And in fact, many clinicians around the world have wondered about other types of hair loss. It's super controversial and people don't talk about it because we spend so much time talking about telogen effluvium that it seems that if we talk about anything else, it just seems like it's, it's not appropriate. The second question the authors wanted to know is how do patients who develop hair loss on isotretinoin differ from patients who take isotretinoin and don't develop hair loss. Is there any difference in these patients? So very unique study, so let's take a look at it. So the authors performed a retrospective study of patients diagnosed with hair loss of any kind in a, in a large database between 2013 and 2018. And they were excluded from the study if they used isotretinoin before the hair loss started. So they started out by looking at patients in a large database that had hair loss. And then they tried to go about finding, okay, in this large database of people that have hair loss, who used isotretinoin after the hair loss started? And patients who developed hair loss after isotretinoin were compared to patients who used isotretinoin and didn't develop hair loss. So they tried to get a further understanding of the characteristics of patients. So when they went about looking at their large database, they found 6,330 patients that had hair loss of some kind over the 2013 to 2018 period. Of those 6,000 patients, 48 had been prescribed isotretinoin at some point. And of the 48 patients, 
there were 19 patients that had hair loss developing either after starting isotretinoin, closely associated with isotretinoin, or after isotretinoin was started. So it gave them a small database of patients who seemed to be developing reports of hair loss after using isotretinoin. So a small number, but very valuable information. So the mean age of these 19 patients was 27 years, so a fairly young group. Half were male, half were female. And there were four types of hair loss that these 19 patients said they developed. Telogen effluvium in half, androgenetic hair loss in 26%, lichen plano pilaris in 15.8, and alopecia areata in 10.5. And so when you actually go about looking at these 19 patients, mean age 27, quite a young group, many teenagers were in this database. When you go through this carefully, which I have done, you realize that in this group of 19 patients, you would expect about 12% of them to report androgenetic hair loss statistically. But 26% of them in the study reported androgenetic hair loss. Telogen effluvium occurs in about 2 to 5% of the population. In this study, it occurred in 52% of isotretinoin users. Alopecia areata occurs in 0.2% of the population. And so you'd expect 0.2% of the 19 patients would have alopecia areata, but here it was 10.5. And lichen plano pilaris occurs in maybe one in 2,000 people. In this age group, it's probably even less. But you'd expect 0.05% of patients to have lichen plano pilaris. Here it was 15.8. And so even though it's a small study, it certainly makes one wonder whether there is a higher number of patients in this study who took, androgen who took isotretinoin and developed androgenetic hair loss, alopecia areata, and lichen plano pilaris. It's a small study. Of course, one can argue that it's a small study. These numbers are not uh, to be interpreted in this way. But it's an interesting study because we do not have data of this kind anywhere. And I can promise you that there are hundreds upon hundreds of patients that, that ask us, do you think isotretinoin causes lichen plano pilaris? And my answer is generally, I don't think so. We use isotretinoin sometimes to treat lichen plano pilaris. We use isotretinoin to treat frontal fibrosing alopecia. But this study causes us to pause and wonder whether in fact there could be a very small subset of people that take isotretinoin and develop scarring alopecia. Doesn't prove it. It absolutely doesn't prove it. But we would expect in a group of 19 people that take isotretinoin that pretty much nobody would have scarring alopecia. It's just that rare of a disease. But here, three patients had lichen plano pilaris in a pretty large database. Alopecia areata is pretty common in the world. But in a database of 19 patients, we wouldn't expect 10.5% of, of the patients to have alopecia areata. Is it? A coincidence? Is it a fluke? Could be. 19 patients is a small study. But there is a question that exists on the mind of clinicians around the world who treat large numbers of patients. Could isotretinoin, in very rare cases, induce alopecia areata? The answer now is probably not. But if you look in the medical literature, there are studies that say isotretinoin does not cause alopecia areata. And there are studies that say, here's a patient who developed alopecia areata after using isotretinoin. 
And our feeling now is, oh, that's just a coincidence. That a good study would not report that because it's a coincidence. I think what this study does is it keeps the subject matter on the radar. There are large numbers of very experienced clinicians around the world who wonder whether isotretinoin use fuels the development of androgenetic hair loss in people that are predisposed to it. Now, it doesn't happen to everybody, of course, but is there a small percentage of people, I don't know what the number is, one in a hundred, one in five hundred, one in a thousand, who use isotretinoin and their androgenetic hair loss is pushed forward at a higher speed than had they not used it. We don't know. It's controversial. But I assure you there are many clinicians around the world that wonder this question. And there are many patients around the world who ask us, does isotretinoin cause scarring alopecia? The answer right now seems to be, I don't think so. This study is a very valuable study. It's one of a kind. We do not have this kind of data. And I think it's, it fuels further study. And the authors are very careful in this study to say, I don't know, maybe it's a coincidence. But I think it's very relevant for us to continue to study this question. So the authors went on to look at the characteristics of patients who use isotretinoin and develop hair loss compared to patients that use isotretinoin and do not develop hair loss. They looked at various demographic features, cumulative dose, duration of treatment, and what they found is that overall, compared to patients on isotretinoin without hair loss, patients who develop hair loss are older, they use isotretinoin for longer, and they use higher doses of isotretinoin. So I think this is really relevant because it suggests to us that isotretinoin probably causes more than just a telogen effluvium. And it certainly is controversial as to whether any of these other hair loss conditions, androgenetic hair loss, alopecia areata, scarring alopecia, are even in the discussion. Absolutely. But it certainly is not in keeping with just a telogen effluvium if patients that are on medications longer and longer and longer number of months are more likely to develop certain hair loss conditions. Telogen effluvium generally occurs between one and three months after most medications. When hair loss is occurring longer and longer periods of time after people are on medication, it suggests that there are other mechanisms at play. So I think this is an interesting study. This was not a study that set out to determine how common is hair shedding from isotretinoin. No, those studies have been done. This was a very unique study which set out to try to characterize the types of hair loss that occur in isotretinoin users. Tough study to do, but the data here is important and it gives us food for thought. And it suggests that perhaps there's more than just a telogen effluvium mechanism happening in isotretinoin users. It's controversial, but this is a start and I really like this study and I think that it keeps the, keeps the door open for other good studies to come and address some of these key questions that remain now. So from isotretinoin, let's move on to talk about trichotillomania. Are there patients with trichotillomania who develop hair pulling, lose hair, and then somehow naturally resolve without drugs, without therapy, never to pull again? Well, that question hasn't really been addressed before in the medical literature, but this study now by Grant and colleagues in October 2022 seeks to answer that question. So trichotillomania is often viewed as a chronic condition, chronic lifelong condition, but some experts have called that into question whether in fact there are some people that resolve 
even without treatment. It's certainly well known that there is a phenomenon of natural recovery in young children. Young children aged three to six, we often say, may pull their hair for a limited number of months and then stop and do not go on to have lifelong trichotillomania. So we know that this concept exists. But there hasn't really been a lot of good research on the natural resolution or the natural recovery of patients with trichotillomania who don't receive treatment. So natural recovery means that a patient once had trichotillomania and no longer has trichotillomania. And natural recovery means that they have not received any pharmacologic therapy and they have not received any counseling or other psychiatric treatment. Their trichotillomania just resolved on its own. So Grant and colleagues published a new study which screened over 10,000 adults age 18 to 69, and this was thought to be representative, representative of the U.S. population. Patients were screened for whether they had trichotillomania in the past or trichotillomania now. And in total, about 25% of this entire sample of people who once reported trichotillomania stated that they no longer had trichotillomania and it resolved without therapy of any kind. In other words, they had natural recovery. Who is less likely to have a natural recovery of their trichotillomania? Clearly, 75% of patients do not have this spontaneously resolving form of trichotillomania. Natural recovery was less likely if patients also had obsessive compulsive disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, panic disorder, skin picking disorder, or tick disorder. And in particular, Patients that had obsessive compulsive disorder were less likely to have natural recovery. And so I really like this study. It's unique. This body of information is not available in our trichotillomania literature in any significant form. And the authors point out, Dr. Grant, who's a very well-known author in this field of trichotillomania research, points out to us that in other mental health conditions, natural recovery does occur. In obsessive compulsive disorder, the authors point out that about 20% of patients in the past have been shown to have their OCD resolve spontaneously without treatment of any kind. Now, 80% of patients do not. But there are some patients that do. The authors point out that in major depressive disorder, a recent meta-analysis in 2021 by McConan showed that about 12% of patients with untreated depression achieve a remission in 12 weeks. So there are patients that have various mental health issues resolve spontaneously. Now, it is a minor proportion but it is a phenomenon that is understood to occur in various parts of the psychiatric and psychological literature. The finding here is that about 25% of adults with trichotillomania can recover spontaneously or naturally from their trichotillomania, and it does not always follow a chronic or persisting course. And the value here is that there are certain comorbid conditions like obsessive compulsive disorder, like attention deficit disorder, that allow us to predict that patients with these comorbid conditions are a little bit less likely to have any kind of spontaneous or natural recovery. We move on to another study in the trichotillomania literature, a study here looking at attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in patients with trichotillomania. This was a study published in the July issue of Psychiatry. Now, previous research has suggested that most individuals with trichotillomania do have one or more comorbid health, mental health issues. 
And we often say that trichotillomania co-occurs with other mental health issues. In 1991, Christensen, another prolific author in the trichotillomania literature, published a very nice study showing that about 81% of a study of chronic hair pullers met the criteria for another psychiatric disorder. So when we see patients with hair pulling and trichotillomania, it is very common to find another psychiatric disorder present in those patients. And in fact, it's unusual if we don't. A recent survey of 175 adults, again by Grant and colleagues, found that 53% of those with trichotillomania had anxiety, 45% had depression, and 29% had coexisting attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And so these are well known in this trichotillomania literature that many patients with trichotillomania have other psychiatric conditions. And that is one reason why it's so valuable to encourage our patients with trichotillomania to seek psychiatric and psychological help. Yes, we do know that N-acetylcysteine can help trichotillomania, but if at all possible, if a patient is agreeable to seek psychiatric or psychological care, it's wonderful because our psychology and psychiatry colleagues can help identify whether there are other comorbid conditions. If you just help the patient's trichotillomania resolve, but you don't help their anxiety because you didn't know they had anxiety, or you don't help their depression because you don't know how to screen for depression, or you don't help their attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, you haven't helped the patient as fully as you could. And so it's really important to appreciate that many patients with trichotillomania have other mental health issues, and we need to get our psychology and psychiatric colleagues on board. So what do we know about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and trichotillomania? Well, we know that some patients with trichotillomania can have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Some studies have suggested as high as one out of three patients with trichotillomania have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in the adult population. It's also a relevant topic because there's this growing body of literature that we've talked about here on the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast that some ADHD medications might actually come with a risk of triggering trichotillomania. Now it's a low risk, but the suggestion is there that some patients, perhaps children more than adults, but it's a growing body of data that suggests that maybe some ADHD stimulants trigger trichotillomania. They don't in all, but at small risk. So the authors of a new study set out to determine how commonly ADHD occurs in patients with trichotillomania. And they wanted to determine if you have trichotillomania and ADHD, do you have any kind of a different course or a different prognosis? than if you have trichotillomania without ADHD. So they assessed 308 adults with trichotillomania. They were assessed for ADHD diagnoses using various validated scales. And they were evaluated for the severity of trichotillomania, quality of life, psychological dysfunction, and other parameters as well. So in this particular study, 15% of patients with trichotillomania had ADHD. 36% of them were using stimulant medications for their ADHD. But patients with ADHD and without ADHD didn't really differ in their age, their gender, their race, their ethnicity, or their education. In addition, There was really no difference in the severity of trichotillomania if someone had ADHD, the quality of life they had, their functional impairment. These did not differ. There was no difference in trichotillomania severity if you had ADHD, quality of life, disability scores. So I think this is very important, that 
ADHD does not carry significant negative prognosis in our patients with trichotillomania. So overall, somewhere between 15 and 30% of patients with trichotillomania are expected to have ADHD. In a prior study, Grant and colleagues suggested it's 29%, here 15%. The main message here is that there's a significant proportion of adults that we see in the clinic who have ADHD as well as their trichotillomania. ADHD in the adult population in general is around 2.5%. And so the message here is that ADHD is probably 5 to 10 times more common in patients with trichotillomania. ADHD is thought to be underdiagnosed in adults, undertreated, and it can be very debilitating. It can affect multiple aspects of people's lives, their family structure, social life, their work life. And I think that's important for us to keep in mind as hair specialists when we evaluate patients. That there's many patients with trichotillomania who have ADHD, and we need to make sure they're given the proper support. We need to make sure our trichotillomania patients are evaluated for whether they have ADHD, whether they're evaluated, do they have anxiety, do they have depression, do they have obsessive compulsive disorder. You as a hair specialist may not feel comfortable using validated screens for ADHD, for obsessive compulsive disorder, for depression, for anxiety, but certainly there are some basic questions that you can ask that may highlight the possibility and allow you to engage in some discussion with your patient. You may say to a patient, I know you don't want to see a psychiatrist. You've expressed this to me and I appreciate this, but I'm, I'm concerned that you may have ADHD or you may have obsessive compulsive disorder or you may have depression. I'm not qualified to evaluate that fully, but it certainly suggests, based on the information you shared with me, that you may have these conditions. And I think that there are specialists out there that could dramatically help change your life, help you. They may help first give an accurate diagnosis and help with treatments of various kinds that can help you feel better and can help make life better for you. And so it's these kind of discussions that are so valuable that we need to keep in mind with our patients with trichotillomania. It's not just about treating hair loss and getting hair to grow. Sometimes that's easy. It's not always easy, of course, but sometimes it's a lot easier to get hair to grow than to get patients to uh, receive the help for some of the broader conditions. Finally, from uh, trichotillomania, we move to iron deficiency, anemia, and a clinical sign of blue sclera that we need to keep in mind as a clinical finding in patients with iron deficiency anemia. This was a nice report by Dr. Cano in the Cleveland Clinic Journal of Medicine in October. Certainly iron deficiency is really important for us to know as hair specialists. Low ferritin levels can sometimes be associated with hair loss especially when ferritin levels get 20, 15, 10, 5, 2. That's when really telogen effluvium can occur. It's somewhat controversial what the exact cutoff is for ferritin levels, but it's pretty clear that once you start getting below 15, that it's pretty likely you're going to have a telogen effluvium from low iron. There are a number of features on history that can suggest iron deficiency. These include fatigue, headaches, shortness of breath, difficulty concentrating, weakness, dizziness, paresthesias or pins and needles, depression, anxiety, irritability, restless legs, cold hands and feet, pica, craving for non-food items like clay or dirt, as well as pagophagia, craving of ice. These could be signs of iron deficiency. Brittle nails, smooth tongue, these are also sometimes seen in those with iron deficiency. So there are features on history which can suggest iron deficiency. 
On examination, the specialist can identify several findings which are a tip-off that maybe this patient in front of me has iron deficiency. Those include spoon-shaped nails, rapid heart rate, smooth tongue, which we call atrophic glossitis, cracking of the corner of the lips, which is angular chelitis, aphthous ulcers, pallor of the conjunctiva, the palpebral conjunctiva, especially when hemoglobin levels get quite low and pale skin. Now, one thing we often omit from this list of clinical features seen in those with iron deficiency is the blue sclera, or blueness of the whites of the eyes. And a lot of these clinical findings are easy to miss because the terminology doesn't really fit in with what we think it should look like. Spoon-shaped nails don't look like perfect spoons. And so spoon-shaped nails requires one to have a little bit liberal of a definition in terms of what a spoon is. This is a very nice study by a uh, report by Yasha Hura in Internal Medicine in 2013, which shows what spoon-shaped nails look like in patients with iron deficiency anemia. You can see there's this groove in the middle, and they look somewhat like spoons, but you have to have a... A, um, a generous interpretation in terms of what spoon-shaped nails look like. And so if you're expecting nails to look like spoons, you're going to miss spoon-shaped nails. And so they have this curvature to them. In those with iron deficiency anemia, there can often be pallor or whiteness to the conjunctiva. What is the conjunctiva? Well, it's this normally pinkish color when you pull down the eye that we look for in patients with iron deficiency anemia. Spoon-shaped nails, pallor to the conjunctiva are commonly thought about in those with iron deficiency anemia. Blue sclera is something we often don't think about. The sclera is the white of the eyes. The hole in the middle is the pupil. The area around the eye is the iris. But the sclera is the white of the eye. Very nice study by Lobis, published in the Journal of Clinical Medicine 2019, gives us some assistance in terms of what blue sclera look like. You can see the normal white of the eye. Sometimes blood vessels are seen in the white of the eye. When the eye is red, we um, are concerned about infection and other inflammatory and autoimmune conditions, as well as a whole host of differentials. But when the eye is blue, there's a unique set of conditions that can cause that, and iron deficiency is one of them. If you're expecting the white to be blue, like the sky, you're going to miss blue sclera. But if you have, again, a generous and liberal interpretation in terms of what blue sclera means, you may pick up blue sclera more commonly. It is a grayish type color, grayish blue type color, which just is a different color than the white of the eye that you normally expect. So we have clinical findings, we have findings on history of patients with iron deficiency, and of course we have lab tests. In iron deficiency, the ferritin level is reduced, often under 20. In iron deficiency anemia, the ferritin level is decreased, but the hemoglobin is also decreased under 12 grams per deciliter for those in the U.S. And for many parts of the world, 120 grams per liter is the units. When hemoglobin gets below that, we have an anemia. But there's several other lab parameters which suggest iron deficiency that are important to be aware of and iron deficiency anemia. In the setting of iron deficiency, the MCV may be under 80. The RDW may be above 14, especially 15, 16, and 17 as the iron deficiency becomes more profound. There may be reduced serum iron and increased total iron binding capacity a reduced transferrin saturation, low MCH, low MCHC, or mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, and a reduced hematocrit. 
And so when I see patients with suspected iron deficiency, I of course want to know what the ferritin is. And you want to know what the hemoglobin is to determine if they have an anemia. But there's all these other parameters that are on the blood test report that are helpful. And in some cases they're increased, in some cases they're decreased, but all of these give some clues that indeed the patient may have iron deficiency. So Dr. Kano from Japan presented this very nice article of blue sclera in a 46-year-old woman with fatigue, shortness of breath, and her iron deficiency was thought to be from heavy menstrual cycles due to her uterine fibroids. Examination showed pallor or paleness to the conjunctiva. The patient had spoon-shaped nails, and the patient had blue sclera. Lab tests showed a hemoglobin of 4 grams per deciliter. Normal value is 12 or above. This was 4, or in our uh, grams per liter units, 40. We normally expect hemoglobin above 120. This was 40. And the ferritin level was 0.8. And this is a very low ferritin. Occasionally we see ferritins of 0 and 1. Most people have ferritins anywhere from 30 to 70. Those are quite common ranges. This patient had 0 0.8. And other parameters in the blood test report were abnormal, including abnormal hematocrit, abnormal MCV of 54. Because of the iron deficiency, this patient is producing very, very small red blood cells. The MCV is small. The transfer and saturation was 2.8. Patient had a blood transfusion, started taking iron supplements, was treated for the uterine fibroid heavy bleeding, and her hemoglobin then increased, her ferritin then increased, and the blue sclera resolved. And so a really nice report. We don't often talk about blue sclera in the setting of iron deficiency. We talk a lot about spoon-shaped nails. We talk a lot about pallor of the palpebra. Um, we talk a lot about fatigue. We talk a lot about, uh, you know, shortness of breath. But blue sclera is indeed part of the clinical manifestations of iron deficiency anemia. It was the great William Osler in 1908 that first described the blue sclera in a group of iron deficient uh, adolescent females. A publication in The Lancet by Calra in 1986 showed just how important blue sclera are. And Calra and colleagues reported that blue sclera was more common in patients with iron deficiency anemia than other types of anemia. So that it's a very important finding for iron deficiency anemia. The presence of blue sclera was unaffected by age, sex, or the color of the iris. Blue sclera had a sensitivity of about 90% and a specificity of somewhere between 65 and 94% for iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia. So these are somewhat sensitive and specific signs for iron deficiency anemia. In 1971, Pope published a study again in The Lancet looking at the predictive value of blue sclera in iron deficiency in healthy people attending an outpatient clinic. There was 1,800 patients that were screened in that outpatient clinic, and a blue sclera was found in 41 of those 1,800 patients. 83% of patients with a blue sclera had iron deficiency. So not everyone with blue sclera has iron deficiency, but most do. So what is the big list of medical conditions that can give a blue sclera? Well, iron deficiency anemia is at the top of the list. And we need to know that one because most people with a blue sclera have iron deficiency anemia. Osteogenesis imperfecta is another one. Rheumatoid arthritis, myasthenia gravis, the disorders of connective tissue and collagen disorders like Ehlers-Danlos, pseudoxanthoma elasticum, incontinentia pigmenti, high myopia, the drug minocycline, and long-term steroids can give a blue sclera. Why do we get a blue sclera? Well, it's thought that in all of these conditions, 
the fibroblasts just don't make enough collagen and so there's a problem with the collagen and this makes the uh, eye more see-through so the choroid can be more easily seen and the blue color comes out and so the bluish color of this underlying uvea structure becomes more visible once iron levels come up collagen is made in greater abundance and the eye sclera appears white again in these conditions like osteogenesis imperfecta and these other collagen vascular disorders there's again a problem in the production of collagen and the underlying uvea can be seen and it gives a blue color and so that brings us to the end of Season 3, Episode 1 of the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast. I thank you so much for listening. We reviewed tinea capitis in a 7-year-old individual who had a guinea pig. We talked about T. mentagrophytes, and we talked about T. benhamii, and how guinea pigs can harbor these fungal organisms asymptomatically. And so when we're taking histories of patients with tinea capitis or suspected tinea capitis, we need good histories. Family pets are important, not only the dog and the cat, but the guinea pig. We talked about the Omicron wave and how it differs from the Delta wave. Omicron may be associated with less hair loss, and it seems to be um, a less relevant clinical finding in the Omicron wave. And more studies of the kind are needed, but I think this is really relevant because it's teaching us that many dermatologic manifestations are less common in the Omicron wave. We talked about hair loss from isotretinoin and the fact that patients that use isotretinoin longer and at higher doses report more hair loss. And perhaps there's more going on than just telogen effluvium. Perhaps there is some patients who use isotretinoin and have a greater likelihood to develop other conditions like precipitating androgenetic hair loss or alopecia areata or lichen plano pilaris. This is highly, highly controversial, but this study is the first of its kind. It's a small study, but it opens the doors to further studies which can address these in greater depth. We talked about trichotillomania. 25% of patients have trichotillomania and then resolve spontaneously never to have trichotillomania again. We talked about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and trichotillomania. Anywhere from 15 to 30% of patients with trichotillomania have ADHD. Patients with ADHD seem to have a similar course, similar prognosis, similar severity, similar quality of life to patients with trichotillomania that don't have ADHD. And finally, we talked about the blue sclera as a sign of iron deficiency anemia. We talked about a female individual with profound anemia, profound low ferritin, a ferritin of 0.8, and had blue sclera, as well as pallor of the conjunctiva, as well as spoon-shaped nails. Transfusion, as well as iron supplementation, brought the hemoglobin up, brought the ferritin up, and the blue sclera resolved. I thank you again for joining us. If you'd like to reach out to our clinic at any time, you can do so. We're at info at donovanhairacademy.com. We really appreciate all the comments and feedback that we have received. And I thank everyone for these comments over the last few months. Well, we have been between season two and season three, and the kind comments and feedback we've received is very much appreciated. And I'm glad that the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast is a help to many. Next week, we're back for season two, uh, episode two of season three, and we'll be talking about scarring alopecia, and I'll look forward to welcoming you back here on the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast.